Howdy gamers, it's Leighton here from Leighton Night, the podcast that you're currently listening to in case you accidentally stumbled upon this, in which case I am sorry, but just wanted to let you know that there is a video version of this episode that is up on our Patreon for all tiers. So if you want to join us over there, depending on the tier, you can get all sorts of cool benefits. We do mini-sodes every week. We do some fun videos. Uh, you get access to our fan discord. And overall, it's a really lovely time and we would love to have you there. So without any further ado, here is the audio version of this episode. So if you want to do the video version, you can go to patreon.com slash Leighton Knight, or not. It's really whatever floats your boat. Anyway, episode... Oh, oh my yes. goodness. This is Jade. Jade. Hi. I just woke her up, so. <laughs> How old is Jade? Jade's 14. She's a little baby. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. She's like, you know, I need these naps. <laughs> How old maybe? She's going to be four in January, but she just looks like a permanent puppy <laughs> with her sweet little head. Is she a puggle? She's a Chihuahua mini pin mix. Oh, very cool. She's got the floppy ears, but if you try to put them up to look like a chihuahua. It's like they're too big for her. She's just got little Dumbo ears. <laughs> she doesn't trip over them, does she? <laughs> she might, honestly. She's a little stick of dynamite. What kind of dog is Jade? Jade's a border terrier. Cool. They're from the section on the border between England and Scotland. Her natural environment are the moors. Oh, nice. Yeah. Rainy and cold. That's her perfect walking weather, unfortunately. <laughs> I grew up with Cairn Terriers. We had, I guess, two for most of my childhood. And right. I think it's pretty much the same thing. Some kind of British terrier. Right. And was constantly going after anything that looked like a small rodent. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Although Jane would not know a rodent if it came up. She'd be totally friendly to it. And I love terriers. There are people who love terriers and think they're a hoot and people who have given up on life. Because <laughs> so, you have to stay one step ahead of them. Yes. This is very true. We had two, Truffle and Lily. And Lily had some mental health issues. But Truffle, anytime a door would open, that dog would make a beeline for it and try to immediately get out. To the extent where you're like, what are you thinking? You know, this is not a smart decision. What's your plan? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, I love Terriers. Yeah, me too. The thing is that, you know, you have to give them a job or they're going to make one up on their own. Mm -hmm. And it might not be something you want them to do. Like when Jade was a puppy, we used to keep our shoes by the front door and she decided all of the shoes belonged on the other side of the house. So one day while I'm out, she took every single shoe for my entire family and just transported it to the back door. And I come home and all the shoes are missing. I used to also have a basket of school supplies when my kids were little. Mm -hmm. And in its place, I found a package of loose leaf paper and a chew bone. <laughs> Her thought process was so interesting. Like the shoes don't belong there. But mm -hmm. if I put something else there, she won't notice. I love that. I, lo I love it when animals exhibit some kind of organizational mentality. Right. Or she just thinks I'm stupid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel like is maybe what all dogs assume about their humans. I think they just feel sorry for us. Yeah, this one, like between the ears, there is nothing. It is a void. All she wants to do is sleep and be on the warmest lap in the room. Aww. And I'm happy to provide. You do, Layton, have an unusually stupid dog. Yeah, it's incredible. She steps on a stick weird and starts screaming. And this happens every time I take her for a walk. Like Aww. she's such a drama queen and she will scream at full volume. And I've checked, I've talked to the vet. There's nothing wrong with her that would be causing this. She's just a drama queen. And then I'm walking and she screams. And then everyone looks at me like I'm a monster. And it's like, she, the, 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 a twig scared her because she's so small. When you are that small, everything in the world is scary. And also she has a very anxious mother. So I get it. Comes by it naturally. But she's just too, too cute. This is the second time in two weeks I've tried to visually throw to my dog and she's never there. <laughs> Fantastic. We ended, I think when you did Crosswords Live, we ended on ducks mm -hmm. the other day. 
And, you know, why not get started on dogs? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for both of you. Temperament and appearance wise, what kind of dog do you think you would be? Oh, I think I'd be a medium sized dog. Never shuts up constantly barking mm. like to the extent where people are like what is this dog's deal and just regular bam 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 <laughs> over and over and over 24 hours a day you know that famous sound that dogs make bam bam yes right <laughs> it's the emerald breed yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd probably be a golden retriever of some sort or a standard poodle because of the curls. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those kind of dogs that just sort of hangs out and goes, this is cool. Yeah. Standard poodles are pretty chill, right? They're like very nice dogs, as I understand it. Yeah. It depends on the dog. It depends on the owner. I actually, in another life, was a canine behaviorist. Oh, really? I don't say that a lot because it was so long ago, but they're very smart. They're one of the smartest breeds I've ever seen. So I want to hear about this, the canine behaviorist stuff. Like, did you go to school for this? Like, I worked with a lot of behaviorists and I, I was mentored by them. And we basically, it's not really obedience training. It's more about living peacefully with your dog and help settling any issues that you might have with the dog, tracing where the problems came from and working with the owner and the dog to sort of settle them down. A lot of dogs suffer from anxiety, separation anxiety. Sometimes there's biting and there's always a reason why that happens. And there's always a mm -hmm. solution to it if the owner is willing to put in the work. From your perspective on that, how much of dog problems are actually owner problems versus dog problems. <laughs> People get so angry at me when I say it, but the dogs are very responsive to their owners. Mm -hmm. They look to us to see whether everything is okay. So if a dog is suffering from some sort of anxiety, I would probably tell the owner to model, even if you have to fake it, model some sort of chillness and confidence and teach the dog to be confident. And you also have to expose them to these things that make them anxious, you know, slowly and, and humanely in order to sort of dilute the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's like a pack thing, right? They have this pack instinct to be whatever the surroundings are being. Is that what it kind of is or what? They're very hierarchical dogs, yeah. much more so than cats. And, you know, honestly, their wants and needs are very similar to our wants and needs. They just have different priorities. Uh -huh. So, you know, they want to feel safe and secure and they don't care if they're a lower member of the pack as long as they're in there somewhere and they know which level they're at. They don't want to have to try to figure out whether or not they're an alpha. They don't want to have to try to figure out if they're not in the pack at all. So usually a lot of the work I did with the owners was showing them how to communicate with the dog to let them know that, you know, the same thing you would do with a parent, where you talk about making a child feel secure, that nothing's going to happen. Mom and dad are here for you. We're here to keep you safe and secure. And if it's an adult problem, you let the adults take care of it. And that goes a long way toward curbing what turns out to be anxious behavior. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's part of why like structure when you're training a dog is so important too, of like Absolutely. times, routine, but they're comforted by things happening at the same time. And when they don't like, you're going to be anxious. Yeah, same thing with a kid, at least yeah. a little kid, right? Yeah. Is it's all about having structures and expectations and being predictable and, you know, doing the same thing over and over and over. Right. For sure. Who would have thought small creatures are extremely molded and influenced for the rest of their life by the circumstances in which they are brought up? <laughs> yeah. Deb, you have kids, right? I do. I have two. They're grown, but they're they're still mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful way to put it. Yeah. Thank you. How old are they? My older one is 26 and my younger one just turned 22. Oh, oh wow. nice. You survived it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have younger kids, Brian. Yeah, I have a, a seven-year-old daughter. Jesus, 22. I can't even imagine how far in the future that is, even though, you know. Oh, it'll go real fast, I'm sure. Yeah. You don't get it until you live through it. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you tried to explain to someone what being the parent to a seven-year-old is like, people who haven't had that experience yet, 
don't really get it. Just yesterday, I feel like, you know, I was still holding his finger as he was trying to toddle along and, you know, he just graduated from college. Yeah, that's wild. It is. It's very wild. (laughs) I've heard a few people describe like seven through 10 or eight through 10 is kind of the sweet spot of kids. They're all sweet in their own way. There's a little bit of, you know, at 15 and 16 where you just want to pump them right out of the house. Yes, right. But the really cruel trick is you get to the point where you're saying, all right, you know what, I'll just hang in there a little bit longer because they're going to go to college at 17 or 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And this happened with both my kids and it's happened with a lot of my friends and it's very anecdotal, but to a one, every single one of them within a week of leaving for college suddenly turned into the most wonderful person again. And they're like, oh, I don't want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it seems like you just get to that point where it's like, you just can't live with each other effectively anymore. And then once you separate. Yeah, it's a natural part of it. Children have to push you away in order to grow on their own. And It's hard and it's tough because you do and do and do for a person and they need you and need you and need you 24 hours a day for years at a time. And then all of a sudden, they don't need you anymore. And you don't know when it's coming and you don't know how bad it's going to be, but it's like a parental whiplash. Right. I guess, you know, so letting go is is a very tough part. The nice thing is if you do let go, they come back. Right. I'm dreading it. Honestly, like, you know, at seven, she still needs lots of attention and like wakes up. And the first thing she wants to do is crawl into our laps. And like, I can see that finish line a few years away, maybe earlier. I don't know. And it's scary. Like, it is scary to know that is coming. It's also great because, you know, obviously you want your kids to grow up and be amazing, independent people. But it feels like it just gets closer and closer and closer every day because it absolutely does. It does. And that's why they tell you to enjoy every moment. It's not just a sappy idiom. It really is very true. And that's why I think it's important to see the sweetness in each age and each phase that they go through. Even at the most miserable, there is still something lovable about them. And I think, you know, the universe made it that way. So you don't punt them right out of your house. Right. (laughs) So I'd say about a year ago, I could see some of this pulling away, starting mostly with comedy, because that's when I started telling jokes and getting, so she'll look at me, Audrey will look at me and go, not funny. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I get it. That was the hardest thing for me was trying to adjust to the fact that I wasn't cool anymore. Yeah. Well, I'm comfortable with that fact on my own end already. So hopefully I just can stay there. But yeah, yeah. it takes a lot, at least for me, to refrain from saying stuff like, okay, Audrey, not funny. If I'm not funny, just answer this question. Which one of us gets paid for writing jokes? (laughs) So yeah. like, just, just answer, just asking questions. Just answer me that. Right. Brian, that's dangerous. She's going to come straight for your job. <laughs> She's going to sweep it out from under you. She a hundred percent is. She told me, I mean, this is probably about two years ago now. She just one day said, when you die, I will take your place in the band. <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, okay. I'm got like, she's thought this through. <laughs> she thought it through and in fact said it. Like she was awaiting it eagerly. Yeah, that sounds like a threat. (laughs) Oh, it it was not like, Daddy, when you die, I'm going to be so sad and I'll carry on your tradition. It was like, you know, if you died tomorrow, I would totally take your place (laughs) in the band. Um, Uh, I was just looking at, (laughs) I installed some Twitter plugin that does a better job of like searching through tweets. Has a little kind of on the sidebar, an archive of old tweets. And I saw an old tweet of mine, which was a conversation with her where I said, you know, who loves unicorns? And she was like, me. And I said, you know, who loves space? She goes, me. I said, who loves daddy? And she said, nobody. (laughs) (laughs) This is probably a year and a half ago. Like, oh my God, just get owned all the time by this little sass factory. Out of the mouths of babes. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Satisfactory. Yeah. I'm going to go grab a tissue real bit quick and then I'll return. Okay, oh. cool. <laughs> I think we brought Leighton to tears. Yeah, it happens a lot. I'm so funny that she often just has to take a break to take some time for herself to recover. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to introduce you. Sometimes the introduction of the guest will take place an hour into the podcast, but I think we should do it up front. Everybody, this is Leighton Knight with Brian Wecht. Over here, we have Leighton Gray. Hi, that's me. That voice was Brian Wecht, Hi. whose daughter constantly owns him. Yes. History guest, would you care to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Deb Amlin, and I work for the New York Times, but I don't have a real job. At least not as far as my parents understand it. <laughs> no, I write word and edit wordplay, the crossword and puzzles and games section of the New York Times. It's awesome. Yeah, we're very excited to have you on this week. Yes. This is great. Leighton and I are both individually very big fans of the New York Times puzzles. And as I told you a couple of weeks ago, we do them regularly on the show. And it's awesome to have you on. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I think you said you do the minis on the podcast. I think we did a couple of the minis. Usually we just pick two pretty recent ones. Often we'll do like a Thursday, Friday, and then maybe a Monday, Tuesday. We usually do two. That's my sweet spot. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. I have a great time doing them with you, Brian, because if I'm doing crosswords by myself, I don't have the freakish ability to look at like 20 blanks and immediately know what the pun answer is with none of the blanks <laughs> filled in. And he's really good at that. So he is. it's a nice <laughs> balance. Well, to be fair, I think I have 23 years of experience on you. Yeah. But yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Completely fair. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I solved a puzzle with Deb uh, a couple of weeks ago on the Crosswords Live, right? That's the name of it? Yes. Thank you for remembering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And I told her and the audience then that I've been solving the Times puzzles since I was a kid, did it with my mom. We do the Sunday puzzle every week. And it's just been such a big part of my life for, you know, 30 or so years now. So it's really exciting to talk to you who's on the inside of everything. All the inside poop, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a constructor too, right? Yeah, that's actually how I got started. I've been a freelance writer for years and years, but I also needed something creative to do when my kids were really little, you know, babies that didn't involve Pokemon or Elmo. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I had read an article in a magazine about people who make crosswords for a living. And it wasn't as big as it was now. Nobody really understood that there were actual people who made this. Everyone thought they were made a computer. Yeah, they just dropped onto the earth from the heavens. That's right, like yeah. like lodestones. So like, right. oh, look, I found one. And I did pretty well. I had puzzles in the Times, I had puzzles in the Washington Post. I became the X Games constructor for Bust magazine. Oh, really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I was uh, in the original rotation for the AV Club puzzles with The Onion, which was fabulous. I did many of those, oh. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it was just a wonderful thing because the puzzle community is just so amazing. It's mm -hmm. really wonderful, very smart, curious, and, you know, ultimately very kind people. Yes. You know, it's sort of like discovering your tribe. When I uh, started constructing and going to the tournaments and meeting people, I said, oh, I found my people. This is great. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I know a lot of people in this community as well. And almost to a person, they're just generous, you know, interesting. People come from all walks of life. You've got scientists and artists and, you know, everything all across the kind of intellectual spectrum. And generally speaking, people are broadly interested in stuff. So you find these kind of polymathic personalities. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you have so many different kinds of things in a crossword puzzle. Clues can be about anything. So especially when I'm writing a wordplay column, very often something in the puzzle will pop out at me and I'll sort of launch off and tell a whole story about it. Uh -huh. You know, there are so many things that can be brought up for you in the puzzle, whether it's, you know, an emotional reaction or something that you just think is really interesting and you want to learn more about. There's so much to it that part of my job has been to show people that they're not just these two-dimensional uber-intellectual tests of knowledge. Totally. 
Yeah, the emotional thing is really interesting. I find this with trivia as well, or any kind of niche thing. I forget who said this, but it's that feeling of, I thought I was the only one. Yeah. Right. And then you see something, you're like, oh my God, someone else knows this in this context and appreciates it just like I do. Right. It's really a, a special feeling. It's the finding your tribe thing. I find that really omnipresent in the puzzle world. Yeah. We're all word nerds when it comes right down to it. Yeah. Deb, how did you get into the construction of it all? Because I've played crosswords for a good long time, but I didn't realize how much manpower and work and creativity and energy goes into actually constructing them until, you know, this past year, as I started doing them with Brian, who's much deeper in the community than I am. So I'm curious, like, I've done very little research into how to actually construct a crossword, and it's all a mystery to me, and I imagine might be for people listening to this show. So I would love to hear you know, how you got into it. What does that take? Well, part of when you sit down to write, it's very important to get all the words in the right order. (laughs) So I found it really interesting that you could have these little tiny bits of writing. Like I write in sentences and paragraphs and books and articles, but each clue in a puzzle is this little tiny bit of literature that I just love. And it could be a joke. It could be a pun. It could be total misdirection. It could be educational. It could be historical. It could be scientific. Mm -hmm. And you never know until you get to the clue and you try to uh, figure out the answer. I think that when you make those puzzles, it's an incredible feeling of power. Yeah. (laughs) You're making this for the solver. You want them to solve it. But at the same time, it's very hard to resist writing just the most badass clue you can think of for something, which is why we have editors. That brings me to the editorial (laughs) point. Um, The puzzle editors are there to make sure that it's the best puzzle it can be and help you polish it up. But they're also there to make sure that, you know, if you're writing a Monday puzzle, it doesn't have Friday level clues Uh in it. Because it's really like, you know, if you think of a really clever clue, but you know that you're cluing your puzzle for a Monday or a Tuesday, it's very hard not to put that in. What I did was, you know, I would just write it down in a notebook for a later week puzzle because I I don't know if you know, but the puzzles get harder as the week goes on. Uh So step by step, I'm asking like actual interviewer questions on this show, which is a thing thing that never happens. (laughs) Unprecedented. Yeah. Sorry, everyone at home. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But step by step, like how do you construct a crossword? If I was going to break it down into the basic steps, because we could be here for years if I tried to do that. And, you know, there are people who do teach these classes online and, you know, all over the place, which I think is terrific. And we have a series of articles on wordplay that is called How to Make a Crossword Puzzle. But the basic steps are, if you were talking about a themed puzzle, which are those long answers you were talking about, is to come up with a theme. What do you want the puzzle to be about? Which is, you know, sort of the way a writer would say, okay, I want to write a book. What do I want the book to be about? And the theme is a set of four or five answers in the puzzle that all sort of have something in common, whether they sound alike, whether they fall into the same category, or they're all the same kind of wordplay. And once you have that theme polished up so that every single one of them sparkles, you Take a blank grid and you put them in the grid in places that you think will give you the best odds of being able to fill the puzzle. Uh Then you put in the black squares and you have to be somebody who has a good sense of spatial relationships. I'm not great at that. I always had to work really hard at finding the best places for the black squares so that I could fill the puzzle really well. Uh So theme development, place it in the grid, black squares. Then you have to fill around everything. And that's the part where, you know, a lot of people tend to start ripping their hair out because (laughs) you'll fill and fill and fill and it'll be great. And then you'll get to a point and it's like, you know, XQZ and you have nowhere to go. Yeah. So you have to rip it out and take all those answers out, rip it back as far as you think you have to go and then try to fill again. And that can happen really easily and you find yourself you know, banging your head on the desk a lot. 
But once you've filled the puzzle in a way that you think is really good with lots of really cool entries and interesting things, then you clue it and you write all the clues for the puzzle. That actually comes last. A lot of people think it comes first. Interesting. And then you kiss it goodbye and you send it off to the editor and you hope they'll take it. Mm -hmm. When you first were submitting puzzles to the post and time, were those just cold submissions, just send them in and hope for the best? Yeah, well, during the Lincoln administration, which is when I got started, <laughs> it was all snail mail. Right. You would actually print out your puzzle, put it in an envelope, stick a stamp on it, put it in the mail and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of an order in which you would submit. First, I would submit to Will Shorts at the New York Times. If he didn't want it, there was an editor at the Washington Post then named Fred Piscop. I would send it to him. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't want it, there were other places that I would submit it to. And unfortunately, a lot of them are no longer in existence, like the New York Sun had a mm -hmm. great puzzle that was edited by Peter Gordon, and it doesn't exist anymore. But now you can submit online, and you can sort of query the editor as to whether or not they'd be interested in a certain kind of puzzle or a certain kind of theme. But it depends on the editor as to whether or not they would take a puzzle based on a query. Most yeah. of them want to see the full puzzle. Right. Which totally makes sense. Yeah. The thing that I love now about the puzzle world is just how, how big it seems now compared to how big it seemed, I don't know, let's say 20 years ago or something like that. I feel like most of the puzzles were predominantly from straight white men. Yeah, yeah. If not, you know, by most, I mean like 99% or something. Like it, it was overwhelmingly white and male. It still is to a certain extent, unfortunately. For sure. But now you can get puzzles from indie constructors kind of all over the place now, which I really, really love. And some of the places seem to specifically highlight, you know, more diverse voices. I forget, are you part of American Values Club? Not anymore. You know, there was a point at which I think I had just taken the job at the Times mm -hmm. and it got to the point where I couldn't do outside work anymore. I just didn't have yeah. the time. So I'm not a member of them anymore, but I think they have a more open submission policy now. I've seen other people in the rotation. You have the incubator, which is written and edited by women. Mm -hmm. There's so many indies like Sid Sivakumar and Nate yep. Pardan, who does queer crosswords. Yes, I love him. He's love great. Him. And I mean, so many. Paulo Pasco, Brendan Emmett Quigley. Oh, yeah. That guy is very prolific. I was going to say Crusanova also yes. is an interesting one, right? Yeah, it seems like there's just a million different people. I love that now, you know, I knew a small handful of puzzle constructors by name, you know, when I was first starting out. Now I feel like it's like, I don't know, 40 or 50 people. I'm like, you know, oh my God, it's a Deb Amlin puzzle. Oh, you know, sort of like, <laughs> it's so much fun. I think so too. And, you know, because a lot of these people are my friends, I wanted people to know who they are. I think, you know, with crossword puzzles, it should be like music. You know, you should have a favorite constructor, like you have a favorite band. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was one of the reasons I started a feature a few years ago called Who Made My Crossword? Mm -hmm. And it's a spotlight. It's an interview that I do with a constructor one a month. And we do commission a portrait, you know, an animated portrait of them. And so people can actually meet the people who are making their puzzles and get to know them a little bit better. That's so great. I found out a lot of names originally from Games Magazine, mm -hmm. which I presume you were a subscriber and perhaps even contributor to, uh, to that back in the day. I've been in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no, I love Games Magazine. Yeah, so many of the people who were writing for that or constructing stuff for that, you know, you just see all over the place. Layton, do you know Games Magazine? You might be too young for this. Nope. Oh, that's still around. Oh, it still is. Okay. Oh, yeah. I did an interview with them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of out of the loop on that. Old man, what are these things you call <laughs> magazines? I feel like it maybe it went out of business for a while and then maybe came back. I can't quite remember. You, know, you might be right about that. Yeah. But at some point in the probably late 80s, they had something where they were literally just selling off old issues for cheap. Yeah. And my father, as a present for me, maybe a birthday present, bought literally every back issue of Games oh. Magazine like that he could get his hands on. And I had these, a stack of cardboard boxes, probably as tall as I was, with 
hundreds of issues of Games Magazine, you know, from, I forget when it kind of really started, but probably into the late 70s, it was like 10 years of Games Magazines. Like, I was so obsessed with it. I knew the covers that I didn't have and and <laughs> oh. that sort of thing. You know, I, I couldn't tell you literally anything about what those covers are now. It was like Tiger Beat. For word words. <laughs> exactly what, yes, it was my tiger beat, 100%. You should put the posters up of, you know, like wool shorts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By the way, Rachel and I definitely talk about this. How I love how they shout out Will on Brooklyn Nine-Nine occasionally. Oh, yeah. I yeah. actually got him the role on that. Oh, you did? Yeah. What? Oh, that's awesome. The showrunner and I had been in contact about something else. And I forget exactly how it happened. It was a few years ago. He had said, oh, my God, we would love it if we could get Will on the show. And I said, well, you know, I'll ask him. So I I called Will and I said, hey, you know what? Would you like to do this? Because he's been on TV shows before. He was on How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. And he flew out did the show and was very, we were all very excited about it. And they cut him down to like maybe a fraction of a second. Uh-huh. Classic. <laughs> and I felt so bad because he was on like a red eye <laughs> to get out. Oh yeah, of course. Right. But it was, uh, I think he's had a lot of fun. I can't remember if that was the episode cause it's been a while since I've seen it, but there's one where Captain Holt is feeling a little intellectually inferior, yeah. right? And he finishes the puzzle, it plays its song, and he goes, yes, play your dunces tune. (laughs) They got the rights for the music for the Finnish tune, the Finnish jingle. So good. Which is actually called San Jose Strut. Oh, really? Yeah, it has a name. I don't think it's available online anymore, because I would always love to have it as a ringtone. Yeah, no, that was a great clip. I like that a lot. Yeah, what a cool thing. And just to see crossword things out there in the world on a popular show, it's great. We're cool now. (laughs) Yeah, right? It was always cool. Everyone else just has to catch up with it. Yes. Thank you. You know, I think of it almost like knitting. You know how like 15, 20 years ago, knitting was something your grandmother did and now everybody knits. Mm -hmm. That's in a sense what I wanted to do for crossword puzzles. And I think we've really gotten to the point where, especially after the movie wordplay, the documentary wordplay came out. Yes, yes. It really gave it a huge bump and Mm -hmm. increased people's awareness. Quite a quirky documentary. I don't know how people suddenly looked at that and said, well, I'll be very cool if I did that. But (laughs) it definitely got it out there into pop culture. Yeah. Did you watch the Palindromist documentary? Oh, the palindrome competition? Yeah. I have not. I've been invited to it and I know that it exists, but I really don't know much more than that. It's a fun movie to watch. I think Will is in it. They get like Weird Al is in it briefly. You know, they get all these interesting showbiz type people. And I hadn't realized that one of our favorite kids authors, John Agee, is very much in that scene. Also, yeah, I've heard his name. Yeah. So I had one of his palindrome books when I was a teenager, and I never put together that it was the same guy as who was doing these kids books that I love so much and read with my daughter. One of the name of one of his books is Go Hang a Lasagna, I'm a Salami Hog, which is a great palindrome. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's one of the earlier things that he was doing was these little, like, little palindrome books where he would draw, because he's an illustrator too. So he would draw the palindrome as kind of like a little one panel cartoon. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's sweet. Go Hang a Lasagna, I'm a Salami Hog. That's a great password. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Nobody would ever get that. (laughs) Now that we've said it. (laughs) So the wordplay team at the Times is you and how many other people? It's a sizable group, right? Yeah. Well, it's growing. It certainly is. It used to be just me and a lot of crying. And (laughs) there were eight columns a week and, you know, lots of other extraneous articles and features. Oh, my God. But I'm very fortunate now that I have some great writers writing some of the other columns during the week, because for every puzzle that is published, there's a wordplay column that is associated with it. 
Every puzzle. Oh, wow. Yeah, at least as far as the crossword is concerned. You know, and we do a variety post every week, but not like some of the ones that are in the magazine, but every crossword that is published and the weekly variety puzzle, there is a wordplay column for. And we help people understand the puzzle and take them through it and just try to wring every drop of joy we can at the puzzle. <laughs> yeah, analyzing it to death, right. Right. So now I have Caitlin Lovinger, who does a great job on the weekends with the weekend columns. And I just brought on Rachel Faby, who also has an indie crossword blog, whose name I, please forgive me, Rachel, I can't remember, but she writes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for me. And I needed to do other things. So I needed to stop writing all the columns. So Rachel does the beginning and midweek and I do Thursday and Friday because those are my favorite days. Yeah. And Caitlin does the others. And I have an associate wordplay editor named Isaac Aaron now who does a lot of other things, you know, I'm on a quick leave right now. So he's doing my columns and he also helps with some of the other features that we do, like the constructor spotlight and the guide, how to solve the New York Times crossword. We have a lot of freelance stuff. Like we just ran a couple of articles on why people don't put periods at the end of texts anymore. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. um, Yeah, that got a lot of hate mail um, from (laughs) older people going, you're going to pry my period out of my cold, dead hands. Yeah. Wait, why do they have a problem with no periods? Like what's... what's... Oh, Layton. Oh, Layton. Oh, Oh, yeah. Well, how would you describe this, Brian? People don't like change. Yes. That's to the point. (laughs) Yeah. Have you read Gretchen McCulloch's book, Because Internet? Yeah. Yeah. So she talks about this exact thing a lot in there is it has to do basically with your amount of internet literacy, I guess, in a sense. And, you know, especially older people were taught that the written word has rules which must be obeyed. And if you are putting something in writing, this is what you do. Punctuation. Yes. Punctuation, capitalization, all these things that I think older people do not realize convey tone and younger people do. Right. And I'm fortunate because I have two children in their 20s who were kind enough to say to me at one point, are you angry with me? Right. And I said, no, why? And they said, because you just texted me with a period at the end of your text. And I was completely perplexed at this. And they had to sit me down and say, mom, Here's what people do now. And I am very proud to say that I have given up the period. Mm-hmm. I've given up most of the punctuation. Thank you. Well, you have to understand something, Leighton. I'm an old. <laughs> <laughs> like, I sort of straddle, you know, the people who object to the change because, again, as a writer, punctuation is something that I deal with quite a lot, except when I'm texting now. Yeah. And, you know, the younger people who have given it up because they have decided that there is a tone conveyed by that. I think you put that really well, Brian. And you don't want to convey the wrong tone to people. Oh, I'm I'm terrified by a text that is in a period. Like, that's (laughs) frightening to me. When did this start? All I know is that one day, one of my kids said to me, don't do that anymore. Yeah, I think it was like, 10-ish years ago, I feel like it really got locked in. Wow. Maybe even before that. I wonder how much of it is like a carryover from now, you know, there were texts and there were emails and then sort of instant messaging trickled in. And with instant messaging, there's definitely that like successive, I'm going to separate my thoughts by individual messages rather than punctuation. And I feel like as texting has become way more instant messagey in form, that like that's sort of where we are right now. A hundred percent. Because if somebody sent you an IM that ended with a period, like you're fucked. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that's a hundred percent right. But I think social media has also contributed to that too. And I have to say, I really have grown to like it because to me as a writer, if you write something on Twitter without any punctuation and it conveys something totally different than something that is punctuated. And I enjoy that as a writer, almost the way a painter would enjoy trying a new color. Yeah. I'm like, this is so cool. I can convey something totally different. It feels to me like Flatland where, you know, you have these two dimensional beings that don't know there's another 
direction that their universe exists in. Yeah. And, you know, you can think of older people as just living in this plane of proper capitalization and punctuation, but there's this whole other axis, in fact, multiple axes of tone that exist that, by the way, it's not like Faulkner wasn't doing this a hundred years ago or something. Exactly. Like, like all yeah. this stuff has existed in novels forever. E.E. E. Cummings. Yeah, I was about to bring up exactly. E.E. E. Cummings. <laughs> Reading E.E. E. Cummings' poems in high school, I was like, wait a second, you can do that? You could just do that. <laughs> he was the only one, right? He was the only one who was allowed to do that. Everybody else punctuated it, except, oh, you know, E.E., e., he's wacky like that. Yeah. yeah. We're going all lowercase. <laughs> you know, I haven't gone back and read many Cummings' poems now with my current tonal vocabulary for text. And I wonder oh, if- Oh, I thought you were going to go for your predilection for saying come on this podcast. Oh, no, of course. I would never, ever do that lately. You, you know, my standards <laughs> of taste are, are much too high. Um, but I wonder if it's like a dream of Olaf clad and big now seems like a text message when you read it or whatever, right? It has a different tonal connotation than it, it used to, I think, to people. I hadn't thought about that. That's really interesting. It's very similar to people who claim that they don't know how to use the singular they, them. Oh, God, mm. yeah. To be gentle about it, those people can go fuck themselves. Yeah, I agree. Like, whatever. We're not going to say anything that hasn't been said a million times before, but this is a thing that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, is totally non-controversial. Everybody does it, and it seems like the only people who really raise a stink over it are just trying to be willfully obstinate. Yeah, I, I agree. Or they have some residual feelings about people who might not be, you know, gender identify the way they do. Right. And, you know, the fact is, you know, until recently, it didn't really have anything to do with gender. The singular they, them has existed for a couple of hundred years. Right. I'm always fascinated by people who say, I don't know how to use that. So I'll say something like, well, what if I told you that I was sitting in the back of a cab and I found a wallet and I called them and they were very happy to get it back. What would you take from that sentence? They said, nothing. It's perfectly fine. I said, so you do know how to use this. Yes, <laughs> of course they do. That's a perfect example. Yeah. People do it all the time. It really pisses me off. There's, I think, some kind of thing where people love being prescriptivist yes. because if I had to guess it's some kind of intellectual superiority or feeling like you know more than they do or whatever and it's just so dumb it is what I also find fascinating and I, you know, this is terrific because I didn't actually go to therapy this week so this is really helping me. <laughs> I find it interesting that these are the same people who are also likely to say People are so sensitive these days. They need yes. to toughen up. They're always looking for something to be offended by. Yes. And yet they're the first ones to be offended. Yeah. I was reading something or other that was talking about parasocial relationships online with celebrities and how like it plays into psychologically like terror management theory of like we are going to create an in-group and an out-group right. because the, being in the in-group assuages the fear of death and encourages that we will like live on and whatever else. And it totally feels like that of like, I'm going to make this insular and prescriptivist because that means I am in group. That means I yes. am safe. That means I will quote unquote live forever. Anytime death anxiety comes into the equation, I'm just like, yes, this is why. I've never heard that term before, terror management theory. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a known concept. Mm -hmm. The denial of death. This is a good book. Oh yes. I never finished it. Becker. Is that right? Yeah. The denial of death, which is basically making the argument like everything that we do is to avoid the terror of all of us are going to die eventually. Also, just look at how sick this cover is. I think I found <laughs> this copy on the side of the road, <laughs> which is the ultimate denial of death. Yeah. Is it pink? Part of it is pink, isn't it? Or is it red? I wish it was pink. My webcam is super crappy, but in a way that it boosts pinks really hard. Huh. I actually was in therapy yesterday and my therapist was like, you seem really upset by this. And I was like, no, I'm wearing pink eyeshadow. <laughs> My <laughs> webcam makes it look like I am crying. Mark Marin talks about that book. I feel like literally every other episode on his podcast, I'd never heard it before. And he talks about it all the time. Of course, Mark Marin loves this shit. That makes total sense. I want to read stuff like that. But right now, given the state of the world, I find that comic books are more my speed. Like I just can't get into the things that are very heavy. It's just too much for me. Yeah, same. Well, on the complete opposite tact, I'm just finding the worst shit possible and shoving it into my brain at <laughs> immense volumes and massive speeds. 
Yeah, you have a real talent for that. Brian, that's how I cope with this world. I find the fictional or different thing to be stressed out about, so I'm not stressed out about my real life. But does that work? No. (laughs) Can I just ferment things? (laughs) Yeah, okay. So I want to talk about this. We mentioned this before we started recording, but I want to talk about the fermentation at least a little bit. I am a pickle and hot sauce fanatic. Uh I've been making vinegar-based pickles for a long time, and I learned that there were other ways to pickle, and one of the oldest ways to preserve food was to ferment it. Uh And what fermentation really is, is a very controlled rot, which mm, sounds appealing, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Leighton, that's the title of your autobiography. Yeah, legitimately, this excites me so much. Excellent. (laughs) Well, let me draw you into my fermentation. So to make a very, very long process short, you're using lactobacteria to change the composition of the food you're preserving, which gives it a very sour and wonderful taste. And you can alter that taste with other things you put in, like garlic or dill. And it's the way a lot of the deli pickles are made. Mm -hmm. So I got into putting things in jars vegetables and I made hot sauces and I got into making wines and meats, which is a form of fermentation. It's a yeast-based fermentation, but it's still fermentation where the yeast eat the sugars in the must and poop it out as alcohol, which I'll bet you didn't know that that was what your cocktail was made of. My dad uh, has been making wine out of fruit that he grows in his backyard for a long time. Oh, Oh, wow. That's where I want to get to. He made like cactus fruit wine once. Oh, I've had that, yeah. Prickly pear. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that's really good. When I was living at home, I was underage and responsible, so I don't know what it tastes like, but people seem to enjoy it. <laughs> I will say that the fermentation smell when you were making the wine is not super great. <laughs> Well, it depends. I mean, you can have skunky smells. It doesn't really have a smell unless, you know, you've gotten some unintended formulations. But look, I've made a dark cherry mead and I made rose petal champagne. Oh, wow. Oh that sounds amazing. I'm not in the champagne region of France, so it's actually sparkling wine. Uh-huh. And hibiscus rose wine. It's it's so, so cool. You can make any combination. And I've made Indian style pickles and Jewish deli style pickles. I've got a couple of things that I grew in my garden this year, like some carrots and cukes that I'm fermenting right now. And it's just fascinating to me because this is what I do is I develop an interest and then I read everything I can about it. What are some of your favorite concoctions that you've made over the past year? Ooh, well, any saltwater brine ferment, the lactic acid, I throw it in vegetables with some garlic and dill, and it is so awesome. Yeah. I don't know the real science behind it, but it's supposedly great for your gut because it's got all the probiotics, very similar to yogurt. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew a lot of string beans, so I made garlic dill string beans, and I really liked the rose hibiscus sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. And I make Concord grape wine, which is like Manischewitz, but you don't get sick on it. It's not quite as cloying (laughs) and sweet because I control the sugar, but it's got that great Concord taste. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff. And I spend a lot of time buying and filling mason jars. (laughs) Listen, cheers, audio listeners. I am raising my mason jar of water. Cheers. (laughs) Pickle culture was such a big part of my childhood in North Jersey. So my, my dad was Jewish, and I remember eating pickles with Leon Feinblum, you know, at family <laughs> events and going to the pickle guys on Essex Street. Oh, yeah. Did you go to Harold's? Uh, well, did I go to Harold's? I, you know, I used to live like 10 minutes away from Harold's. The question is, which Harold's, right? So are you talking Edison or are you talking Parsippany, maybe? Maybe. Really remember? I think I've been to both. I'm not sure. So I used to live in Metuchen. The Edison one is the one that's kind of next to that Holiday Inn, or there's some hotel that's right there. And mm-hmm. so, Leighton, the reason Deb is asking is because Harold's has a pickle bar. Oh, <gasps> what? I'm serious, Leighton. They have like pickled tomatoes, 
sour dills, half sours, garlic, you know, you can just sort of pile up your plate with pickles and then get totally sick afterwards. One of my favorite things in this world is like an olive bar. So the fact that pickle bars exist, Mm -hmm. oh my God. It's the best. Well, the problem is you go to this pickle bar and you get as much as you want on this plate. It's like a all you can eat. And then the sandwiches, of course, are the typical Jewish deli sandwiches where, you know, it's like forty dollars for a sandwich and you eat it for a week. They have the giant rotating thing of cheesecakes and carrot cakes and pies <sighs> where they're literally a foot and a half high. Yeah. And, you know, you get one slice of cake to share amongst six people or whatever. Of course. It's incredible. And certainly it's a sad thing that these delis used to be all over the place. And it's just a very expensive business to run. I I love Jewish delis, always have. So important to me. And by the way, they're amazing in L.A. L.A. is like, I think now is better delis than New York, New Jersey. Whoa. Wow. I grew up in Riverdale in the Bronx, and my first memories are of eating in the Jewish deli that was on Johnson Avenue. I think it was called Liebman's. And they had this metal bucket on the table that was filled with yes. sour pickled tomatoes. And that was yeah. my favorite thing. Yep. There were a few diners in Jersey that had that. And then a few more delis that just had, yeah, the thing of pickles. But there were our go-tos. There was the R&R deli, Rumper Nooks and Paramus. All of these are closed now. Aww. But out here, like, I think more delis have survived in LA than in the Northeast. And there's a famous Nora Ephron column about this, but the best pastrami sandwich in the world is Langer's, which is here in LA. I have been missing Langer's so, so bad. But Layton, here's what you might not know, is the original Langer's granddaughter opened up her own deli, like on the Sunset Strip. It's called Daughter's Deli. And it's the oh, basically the exact same food as Langer's. It's a smaller menu. You know, Langer's has one of the diner style menus where there's mm-hmm. too much on it. That's important to me, though. That's part of the experience. So I'm surprised to hear that the L.A. delis are better. Me too. And, you know, it's because like there's just so many Jewish people out here mm-hmm. and Jewish culture is a big part of L.A. culture. Right. The deli scene rules. And I've gone to more delis here than I did when I was like living back in Jersey as an adult just because they're everywhere. But yeah, like you have to have a Langer's pastrami sandwich. It's the best. Oh, when you get like the pastrami and eggs too, I feel like that's always my move there. That's great. Uh, Yeah, just beautiful over easy yolk, Mm. a little bit of that hash brown or latkes, I guess. And then uh, melt in your mouth pastrami. So incredible. And they do a bagel and lox? They do. I don't know if I've had their bagels. The, The bagel scene out here is fraught to say the least. There was some insane article that said LA has the best bagels in the world now, which is just manifestly untrue. I was going to say. The delis are great. The bagels are getting better. There's a couple, there's Hanks and Pops and a couple things that are like getting closer to what I call real bagels, which is New York, New Jersey. What people said were great bagels out here are, you would take one bite of this thing and you'd be like, what the fuck is this? It's just terrible. That's a quickie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a devotee of H&H. Yes. Even though I'm not in New York anymore, I love it. There apparently a good H&H style or New York style bagel is not that hard to make from what I've heard. I think yeah. uh, Sola, she left Bon Appetit, mm-hmm. had an article about how to make bagels. I haven't tried it yet, but I want to. Yeah. Well, Layton sent me an H&H bagel shipment via Gold Belly for Christmas last year. Oh, I love that gift. I send those all the time. It was great. Yeah. Bagels, lox, cream cheese. I guess it didn't include my note. So for a while, I wasn't sure it had been delivered. And then Brian was left wondering who the fuck sent these bagels. (laughs) So like a month later or something, we were talking on the podcast and Leighton mentioned this. And I was like, you were my mystery bagel donator. (laughs) Like I was so excited to get these, but had no idea who they were from. I was so ready to tear Gold Belly a new one. <laughs> like I was getting ready to send the email and I was like, you didn't happen to receive any bagels, did you? <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, we've been enjoying these things for weeks oh, at that point. Nice. Yeah, it's so horrible when you get a gift and you have no idea who sent it to you. <laughs> yes, totally. Are these anthrax bagels? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good time to move on to segments. Okay, so our first segment on the show is What's Poppin'? We give a recommendation for a book or a movie or a TV show or a video game or whatever that we're enjoying these days. 
It has an amazing theme song, which goes right here. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? All right, that's the What's Poppin' theme song. So, Layton, what's poppin'? Very good, Brian. I don't know what you mean. Don't don't do this. <laughs> I can't ask a question. Is that the issue? You don't like it when I ask questions? No, you're not allowed anymore. Good to know. Oh, boy. I ask the questions on this podcast. What did he do to lose his question for Blue Juice? Oh, what? oh Deb. Oh, it, it's Deb. a long list. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. The list of grievances, crimes against comedy and patience and time management, whatever else. What's popping for me this week is Todd Haynes's early experimental film, Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story, which I watched this morning. Are you too familiar with this? I had no idea that was a Todd Haynes Yes, movie. right? I didn't know it was Todd Haynes either, but it is an experimental short documentary about the life of Karen Carpenter and her struggle with anorexia and, of mm-hmm. course, death from it. But it's all told with Barbies. Excellent. Yeah, like it kind of ruined my morning. It's one of the most incredible like short films I've ever seen. It's amazing, yeah. (laughs) Every shot of it felt like getting punched in the stomach. And of course, because it's very unflattering to the rest of the Carpenter family, his name is Richard Carpenter, right? Oh, I can't remember. Basically sued Todd Haynes because they didn't get licensing for any of the music in the movie because it's pretty much nonstop Carpenter songs. And then also they do very cool, like lots of like fun synth stuff happens in there and a lot of like heavily reverbed, like crossfading between the songs. And it's very like hypnotic. But because of that, the movie became like a cult movie because the only way you could watch it is like bootlegged copies. Right. And so the version that you can watch on YouTube now, which I highly recommend, And part of it, I didn't realize this was intentional. There are a lot of text overlays where it's like dark text over a dark background and you can't really read it. And that was intentional. So like, it's very interesting and like the super grainy, you kind of can't make stuff out really adds an additional atmosphere to it. Just like incredible. Loved it. Highly recommend, especially if you don't know much about Karen Carpenter, but you're familiar with the music because it's so much of it is about challenging, you know, that archetype and the image that they were presenting and how much internal turmoil and like, ah, good stuff. Very relevant and impactful. So that's what's popping for me. And if one wants to rubberneck and watch this, I would see it on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It's like 45 minutes. It's like 30 years ago-ish, right? It was like 89, maybe. Yeah. It's been this cult thing. I don't remember when I watched it a long time ago, but definitely before I knew who Todd Haynes was and had no idea that was him. Amazing. Yeah. Have you seen Safe? No. With Julianne Moore? That's my favorite Todd Haynes. This one's great, but for different reasons. And I like Carol, but I don't love Carol. But yeah, Safe is an amazing movie. And I noticed on Letterboxd, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge surge of people who are watching Safe, which I thought was very funny because the whole thing is that, like, the environment is making Julianne more very mysteriously ill. It's another, like, really good examination of, like, femininity and, like, image and body and all that stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Deb, what's popping? What's popping? They did read a book called Crying in H Mart, which I really liked by Michelle Zahner. And Michelle performs under the name Japanese Breakfast. Oh. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so she wrote a memoir about growing up with a Korean mother. And then, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but the mother gets sick. And it's about not appreciating what you have when you've had it. And a lot of it is about food, which is one of my big interests, obviously. And I tend to really like Korean food and I like Korean culture. So I was fascinated with this. I've spent a lot of time in H Mart, not necessarily crying, but um, (laughs) yeah, I just, I thought it was just such an amazing book. It drains you. It's not an easy read, but there's just so much more to it than just, you know, the mom being sick. Do you listen to her music? I have not. I read the book at the suggestion of somebody, of a friend, and just sort of found out afterward that she was a musician. And I'm meant to sort of look into the music. I love Japanese Breakfast. I love her music videos. Very cool stuff. Yeah, just amazing. She recently put out one with Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos, who I have a huge crush on. Oh, really? She did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Listeners of this show who are familiar with my interests, it's very in line with my interests. It's great. But her music is wonderful. The lyrics are amazing. I had no idea that she wrote a book, so I will like immediately pick that up. Yeah. And like I said, make sure that, you know, you steal yourself for it because it can be very sad at times. But, you know, she talks a lot about grief. Actually, you might really like it. I thought it was terrific. It's not my usual thing, but I did enjoy it. And, you know, there's a little bit of the Amy Tan in it with the mother-daughter relationships. Mm -hmm. So Crying in H. More, definitely a high recommend. That would make an amazing book club pairing with H for Hawk. Did you ever read that? No, I've heard of it, though. Okay. One of my favorite books probably the last 10 years. It's by Helen McDonald, and it is a woman who loses her father and Mm -hmm. takes solace in falconry. It's this book. Yeah. That's nonfiction, isn't it? Yes. It's like memoir, kind of. It's really incredible. She trains this complete asshole of a bird, which is a goshawk. I don't know if it's goshawk or goss. I think goshawk, uh, which are apparently notoriously difficult to train, more so than anything else in falconry. And so she talks about using the training of this bird as a way to kind of overcome the grief of her father's loss. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Which now, I mean, you've got the two H books and one's about a mom, one's about a dad. That's a a fun pairing. Yeah, they go together. Yeah, it's a great book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Did either of you watch the Bob Ross documentary? Not yet, no. No. Oh, I used to watch Bob Ross, you know, painting, The Joy of Painting, Mm -hmm. on public television with my dad when I was a kid. And I took my best naps to it. It was the first ASMR. Uh Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was always fascinated with how these paintings would just sort of like explode on the canvas from nothing. Yeah. And, you know, he's been a cult figure in the ASMR community and the painting community. And apparently there were some really heinous things going on behind the scenes with the corporation that he, he was a part of and that was made on his name and on his hard work. And it was really kind of heartbreaking. You know, it pretty much, I'm not going to say it killed him, but he was ill. But I mean, it didn't help. And while he was dying, they basically stole everything he had ever built oh, right out from under them. Yeah. Terrible. Deb, do you actually experience ASMR or do you just have like an interest? I do. I've had a, a lot of trouble falling asleep for a long time. And I found that listening to ASMR videos on YouTube before I go to sleep is very, very helpful. Mm, Me too. (laughs) I can't do it too much because it tends to wear off if you do it every night. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I find like if I go for like a few nights without doing it, it comes back. Yeah. Hmm. Between that and my weighted blanket, it's... uh, Oh, that's the best combo. You know, it's a really good workout trying to fold one of those things. <laughs> oh, it's a nightmare. Maybe chewed a hole in mine, so I had to get rid of it because the little beads went everywhere. Oh, no. I used to have one of those like U-shaped pregnancy pillows. Not because I was pregnant. They just seemed cozy. Oh, yeah. So I would like make a little nest with that and then put the weighted blanket over it and then pull up some Maria Gentle Whispering ASMR. Let's go. <laughs> I love her. I love her. She's the best. Because she's been doing it for so long. I remember like years and years and years ago before ASMR was a big thing on YouTube. It was like, oh my God, there's a word for this and people make videos for it. Like, she's great. It was the best because, you know, you can experience and I'd experienced it throughout my life, but I never knew what it was. And again, like you said, I thought I was the only one. I thought it was like something weird that I went through. And then I started reading about it and I started seeing more of the videos on YouTube. And then, of course, I actually wrote an article about it for Yahoo Tech. Oh, wow. It's rest in peace. And I think I interviewed Maria. Mm. But it really is very helpful. I find between that and the weighted blanket, I'm it's much easier for me to fall asleep now. Is there a genre of ASMR video that you lean towards? I don't know how to say this without sounding weird, but I find <laughs> that the children who do it tend to have more of an ASMR trigger for me. And I think it's the pitch and timbre of their voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. As a musician, yeah. Well, I don't know, you could be a musician too late, and I'm not sure, but <laughs> a little bit. I also found that there were some people who have a very sibilant S, and that triggers me too. So it's mm. not so much the tapping on things, although that's good too. It's 
whispering voices and soft-spoken and that sibilant S tends to trigger it for me. How about you? Yeah, all sorts. But in terms of experiencing it in life, it was always with like an older person, like explaining something or doing something with their hands, like knitting or just like the very like gentle, Mm -hmm. I don't know, a procedure of it. But now I'll go through phases with different types of ASMR videos. I love all of the like silly role play ones where it's like, you're at the doctor. Yeah, They're so sweet. And like so many of them are so creative. Like I love Goodnight Moon ASMR and Amy K ASMR. Do you ever watch Ting Ting? No. (gasps) You have to find Ting Ting ASMR. I'm, I'm opening this up. She's so good and she's so beautiful. And I don't like when people are very hurried or rushed with it because that tends to stress me out. But when she has these very slow motions and it's very relaxing, I think Brian's about to pass out. (laughs) (laughs) She's terrific. I watch a lot of her videos. I'll check that out. I really like slime videos. I like any of the like crumbly like clay or like slicing yeah. sand or soap carve. Like if it shows up in my recommendeds and it's ASMR, I'm all over it. Like I'll give it a shot. I also really love It's Blitz with a bunch of Zs at the end. She does like very nice like massages on beautiful people and like oh, oils yeah. in the little like dropper bottles. I love that sound. Anything with hair, playing with hair. Yes. Brushing. Maria has several of those like really, really good hair brushing. And like she is clearly like so knowledgeable about a lot of the specific role plays that she does, like the massage therapy ones, the men's suit fitting, like right. all of those. Like she clearly like has experience with it. And so somebody who knows what they're talking about, like explaining this thing to you, like it's so nice. She'll sometimes do things in Russian, which I find works a lot for me. Yes. Her accent, like especially in her earlier videos, like it really does it. She's great. And also people listening, if ASMR seems weird to you or like you haven't experienced it or whatever, I don't know, just check it out. Some people are really weirded out by it, but like so many people I know, like you got to have the ASMR on when you go to sleep. You know, just in case people aren't familiar with it, ASMR has a very long name that I don't remember right now. It's Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, if I recall correctly. Yes. And what it is, is if you've ever sat around and, you know, been talking to somebody with a very soft voice and you get these tingles sort of like at the top of your head, or it could be anywhere, but it feels almost like the skin on the top of your head is tightening and you feel much more relaxed As a result, it's been shown to lower people's heart rates and help with getting insomnia. And I remember when I pitched this article to the editor at Yahoo Tech, he thought I was nuts. (laughs) But it also, I mean, it was about, you know, eight to 10 years ago before it got really big. And I had been a secret closet ASMR YouTube video listener. And I said, this is something that people are using the internet for, and it's very helpful. And to this day, he makes fun of me for it. Of course. I remember probably around that time, seeing a bunch of articles about like whether it was a medically documented thing or not. There are a million other things kind of in this category. It's a concept that's widely accepted, but maybe the scientists aren't sure if it's I don't know what the right word is, discoverable scientifically or something like that. It's pretty convincing that it's a real thing, right? Yeah. I feel like the way that I end up describing it to people who maybe haven't experienced it or like trying to go around it, that thing that you do when you're in school where it's like you crack an egg on your head and the yolk is rushing down. It's that. Yeah. But it's also very relaxing for some people. So whether it's scientifically proven I don't know. But you know what? To me, it's all I'm doing is watching a video and it's a lot less intrusive than, say, taking an Ambien. Yeah. (laughs) So I'd rather do that and, you know, crawl under my weighted blanket. And I'm not averse to, you know, medical intervention if you really need it. But I find that this works for me and I really enjoy it. And I'm glad that we are fellow ASMRers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always so excited to find somebody who also experiences it, even though I know a ton of people who just like the videos because they're calming or like, I know people who work to them in the background and I could not do that because I would be asleep immediately. (laughs) (laughs) Brian, what's popping? What's popping for me this week is a sitcom that I believe season two just came out of, but I just started watching it. It's called The Other Two. 
The reason I, I knew about it is because one of the actors on it is a guy I really like named Drew Tarver, who's very, very funny and does a bunch of stuff. He's on Comedy Bang Bang pretty frequently. But it basically, it's about a child star, like 13-year-old, whose mom is Molly Shannon, who is one of my all-time favorites. Oh, okay. yeah. And the show is about his kind of failures of older siblings who are in their like 20s and maybe early 30s who are struggling whatever's in, in New York City. And their younger brother is like a super mega star. Chase Dreams is his name. And <laughs> they have to reckon with, you know, one's a, a struggling actor. The other, that's Drew Tarver. The other, Helene York, I think is her name. She's just kind of, just generally unsettled in life. And it's very, very funny. Both of them are incredible. Molly Shannon's just the best. Ken Marino plays the kid's manager. And I love a Ken Marino thing. They get all these, you know, New York comedy type people in there. It's a really fun show that's very well written. It's a Chris Kelly, Sarah Schneider creation. They're SNL alums. I think they were co-head writers for a while. And it's worth checking out. I really, really like it. I hadn't heard of that. Yep. It's on HBO Max now. You can see uh, seasons okay. one and two. Doing a quick Google, I'm very intrigued by the headline saying, what if Justin Bieber had two loser siblings? <laughs> and that's the show. <laughs> that's pretty much what it is, yeah. Did either of you watch um, I Think You Should Leave? Oh, well, yeah, I'm a huge fan. I have it. Yeah. I love it. For me, for some reason, I am always entertained by comedy that involves someone who is really irritating. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> I strive to be that person in everything I do. And I just love the way Tim Robinson can land a joke, but make it just torturously long. Oh my God. Yeah. Another podcast I really like. What's that from? Someone described him as the best screamer in comedy. <laughs> and I think that is very, very true. It's like him and Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. Those guys can lose their shit in a way that is the funniest thing you've ever seen. Both of them, they get real riled up and mm -hmm. they kind of, you know, start pounding the table. The vein pops out. The vein pops out. It's so great. It's so compelling. And in fact, you know, in the latest season, Bob Odenkirk does show up in one of the scenes. Yes. Oh my God. That was such a good sketch. I don't want to spoil it. And I just take such bizarre turns. I'm sitting there looking at them. How did they think of this? You know? Yeah. What I really love about it is you feel like if you took a sketch class and you wrote any of those, the teacher would be like, what the fuck is this? No, <laughs> that's not funny. What are you talking about? No, you have to perform it and you have to just sit with it because it goes on and on long past the point where you start to get uncomfortable. Yes, that's right. It's so writerly in a way too. There's one from season one. It's a Vanessa Bayer sketch. It's like they're posting pictures on Instagram. Yeah. And at one point she says the phrase wet, wet mud. And it's just like, <laughs> what a great thing. And also that, you know, she's super funny anyway, but they have these repeated, these kind of like shibbolethy little things that just come up again and again and again and again and are so interesting. The, the sounds are just great. So I really like how they kind of live in these stupid moments that then, yeah, extend way, way, way past where they should go. That is some of my favorite types of comedy. Yeah, mine too. The season one stuff, Baby of the Year, I think is one of the great comedy sketches of all time. Yes. With Sam Richardson. <laughs> it's so inappropriate. <laughs> yes. I guess that's the only one that I've seen from the yeah. show. But very good. You didn't see Frankfurter guy or the hot dog car guy? I've seen memes of the hot dog guy. Hey, that was the meme of the summer. Yeah. I got a smaller phone and I don't use my big phone anymore. So I've been like completely off social media and everything since beginning of August, I think. Good for you. It's great. But I don't know what the memes right now are. And I love it. I don't want to know. But I guess Hot Dog Guy was one of the last ones I ended up seeing. Yeah. Okay, but if you go on YouTube, you can find the sketch there. I will watch it. Find Hot Dog Car Guy. And it's another one of those sketches where it opens on a car that's sort of like crashed through the window, the storefront of a clothing store. And people are like, oh, my God, where did this car come from? And hear him say, yeah, where did it come from? And it pans <laughs> over to him and he's wearing a hot dog costume. 
You know, and it was sort of sort of like the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. Got it. And so you know it's his car, and he spends the entire sketch not only denying that it's his car, but trying to make them feel sorry for him and like clearing out, saying, I'm just gonna take these suits with Yes. (laughs) Until the cops finally come and he runs. But you have to see he strings this out so beautifully. Awesome. The only other one I want to point out from season one is the focus group sketch, yeah. which is incredible and has an absolutely bonkers performance by some older guy with an interesting accent. Yeah. I forget the guy's name, but it's just amazing. They're in a car focus group and this guy starts out being the annoying person in the room and gradually wins everybody over and allies them to <laughs> gang up on this poor sad sack of a dude. It's so funny. It's like Survivor, but like in a seven minute sketch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great. All right. Amazing. Let's move on to Peaches and Lemons. I was going to introduce the segment, Brian. You get your own segment, Brian. You get your whole thing. I'm not hashing this out right now. Layton, I think of all these as our segments, not my segment and your segment. Mm-hmm. So if you think of that as my segment and this is your segment, well, then that's on you. Hey, everybody, it's time for Peaches and Lemons, which is three-part gratitude exercise and one part airing of a petty grievance. And the theme song goes here. Peaches and Lemons. Peaches and Lemons. Great, that was the theme song. We'll start each with a lemon, which is a thing that is a mild bummer or inconvenience. Who's got lemons? The most annoying thing to me right now are phone threads, the kind of thing where it says, if you want to talk to this person, press one. If you want to talk to that person, press two, especially if you're on the phone with, you know, a utility company whose name, say, rhymes with (laughs) Schmerizen. The worst, the absolute worst. Thank God they're not doctors (laughs) because you could drop dead as my mother used to say. And half the time they don't make any sense and none of the options are things that you want to do or people you want to talk to. And then you can't get back to where you were. Yeah, and God forbid that they don't actually solve the problem that they said they solved because then you're going to do it all again. This is exactly what happened to me like last month. I had to go through three rounds of calls, go to an actual store. I'm so sorry. (laughs) My life is so difficult. Well, you know, I really feel for you because there was a time when I actually wanted to just say fuck you to Verizon and we left them and went to another internet cable provider whose name Mm -hmm. I will not name. And they were so horrifyingly bad that I went running back to Verizon. (laughs) When it's so bad, it makes Verizon look good. Yeah, they may have you buy the small ones, but they know it and they really do provide the best service, even if you can't get any. Yeah. Uh, Layton. My lemon for this week is, the lemon is not that I've been playing Cuphead. My lemon is rumor fucking honey bottoms. Oh, yeah. This has been the hardest one for me so far, and I am just suffering. The vertical platforming is fucking bullshit. When she shoots the triangles at you, bullshit. Those triangles are awful. And then the bullets where it's like, oh, oh, perfectly time your drop downs. Don't get hit by the honey at the bottom though. And then like, I can't even get to the last phase, which I already know is the bullshit plane thing with chainsaw arm. No, come on. And I have to finish that one so I can go do the other ones. Like Briny Beard took me like five tries. Briny Beard's not that bad. Yeah. He really isn't. Cal Maria, uh, it's possible. Rumor Honey Bottoms, I don't know how I'm going to get through this one without completely losing my mind. That's my lemon. Can we just say the real quick, in Wally Warbles, when it goes to Tiny Bird for the first time, just terrible. Fully the worst for me. I was stuck on that for like two days, and then I finally got him. No hits taken. Wow, look at you. Okay, Yeah, I know. What did you use to take down Rumor Honey Bottoms? Because I've been using like the lobber and the chaser. Lobber and chaser, that's it. Of getting ahead of the guy and then like shooting up. And then yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So when she comes down as the plane, if you get right next to her and hit her with the lobber over and just blam, 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 I found that very effective. All right. There. And also when she comes down reading the book, you can lobber yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. And that takes a lot of damage out. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. That's my lemon. Brian? My lemon is. As a 46-year-old, I was today diagnosed with asthma. 
apparently I am asthmatic and I have never had asthma before. I've never had any breathing issues in the last year or so. I noticed I was getting short of breath and I was like, well, there's a respiratory thing going around. Maybe I should look into this. And I briefly looked into it and it was no big thing. And then I finally kind of did some more tests and I saw the pulmonologist today and he said, yeah, you got asthma. Wow. And so he said, it's no big deal. I got to try an inhaler for a little bit. Wow. It's sort of a mixed peach and lemon, I guess, because it's also nice to know that I was having this shortness of breath thing and it's like, oh, it's not just me imagining it. Right? They found it when they did a lung function study. Mm-hmm. So oh. it's kind of a, what's a good name for a peach lemon? It's a, you know what? I'm going to call this a Jesse after Jesse Plemons <laughs> because it is a combination peach and lemon. That's Good. Yeah. A Jesse. Yeah. A Jesse. That's very good. I was going to go for like a Pluot or a Loquat. I was thinking of a Pluot too. Yeah. yeah like a Yuzu lemon. Some hybrid fruit. Yeah. Yep. Oh, now I want some fruits. <laughs> but speaking of fruits, it's time for peaches where we will each share three big or small, you know, broad or specific good things that are going on or that you appreciate. I'm happy to go first on this. Peach number one is I got hired to score something, like a little pilot for a TV that some people are developing, and they asked me to do the music for it. Very nice. What? Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, but it's really fun, and I wrote something this morning for it and sent it off, but it's not the kind of thing I've done before, and it's the kind of thing I've been wanting to do for a while, so I'm very excited about it. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Peach number two is yesterday, I was part of a little group test solving an outdoor puzzle hunt on the UCLA campus that a mutual friend of Deb's and mine, Greg Pliska, and another guy, Adam Felber, put together. I haven't done a runaround puzzle event in a few years now, and it was just really fun to be outside in UCLA and run around with a a small group, like a, a couple other people, and just test solve this thing. They're doing it next Friday on the campus. It's not open enrollment. Otherwise, I would tell people we you know how to sign up for it. But I'm going to be one of the people on site next Friday, you know, helping run the thing. And it was nice to be part of the little test solving group, too. And my final peach is when I came home from the puzzle hunt yesterday, I was greeted at the door by a child who had one less tooth than she did that morning. <laughs> And she now has lost within about the span of two weeks, both side teeth on her bottom. Oh my God. So cute. So she just has the two bottom teeth and then gap, gap. And it is really, really cute. Love it. We have a tradition. Whenever she loses a tooth, we give her a little puzzle. I like that. Yep. I've done a word search for her. I did some basic like alphanumeric substitution thing once. And today we did... It's kind of like Hangman, but it was a mouthful of teeth instead of the Hangman. And so every time she guessed a wrong letter, I would write the letter in one of the teeth. And the goal was to solve the puzzle. Actually, this was Rachel's idea. And the goal was to solve the puzzle before, you know, you lost all your teeth. And because she's not a strong speller, because she's seven, it took a little hinting. But who cares? The point is to have fun. It was great. It was a fun morning. So yeah, those are my three peaches. That's amazing. I have three quick ones. My first peach is just, I was hoping that I would have ice in this by the time that I said this peach, but just like a fat glass of ice water, especially in this heat, is just the greatest thing in the world. My second peach is history on this peach. When I was a child, Dan Brown books were my absolute favorite. And like I was reading The Da Vinci Code when I was eight years old. Like that was my favorite book at eight. Really? Yes. That's a good age for that. Uh, Yeah, content that's great for an eight-year-old. But I used to do like lemonade stands and I would always reread it when I did the lemonade stands because adults want to give you money when you're an eight-year-old reading The Da Vinci Code. (laughs) That is the cutest thing ever. (laughs) But into middle school, because I had copies of like Angels and Demons and another Dan Brown book that nobody talks about, Deception Point. And I would carry them in my hoodie pocket in middle school and just like reread them on the bleachers. Oh my God, Layden. Yeah. This is so great. They were like waterlogged because I had dropped them in the tub before. Anyway, I have not reread those books since I was a kid. So I reread Deception Point and I'm rereading Angels and Demons right now. And they're just like, they're so intensely readable and also very nostalgic for me. So that's peach number two. Peach number three is that I took a meeting this week that came out of nowhere 
and is really wild. And I can't say anything about it. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but if it does, it's going to be crazy. (laughs) So I'm excited about it. And even if it doesn't go anywhere, it'll still be, you know, like, yep, that's a meeting I took. That's awesome. So, all right. Those are my peaches. Deb. Cool. You know, obviously I'm going to trot out my family because my kids are great. My partner is great. I'm very, very lucky. Everybody's healthy and happy and on their way to, you know, getting on their feet. And my second one is just a shout out in general to science. I am just so grateful for everything that's happening and the developments and how, you know, people are really showing up to help the world. And this is going to sound odd. It's not really a gratitude thing. It's more of a fascination factoid that I learned this week. I was just sort of dinking around on YouTube and I ran into a video and learned that there is a job called Piper to the Sovereign. And the Piper to the Sovereign is a bagpipe player whose sole job it is to stand under the Queen's window, the Queen of England's window, and play bagpipes for 15 minutes every morning at 9 a.m. Oh, my God. What? That feels like medieval torture. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, I wasn't sure that the Queen actually appreciated this, but it's a hell of an alarm clock. That is a good way for Scotland to stick it to England, though. You got to admit. <laughs> and to get out of bed and away from the bedroom as quickly as possible. Yeah. You flee the bedroom. But what I also loved about it was, you know, say what you want about the royal family, you know, and the whole royalty thing. At a certain point, the Piper to the Sovereign serves a two-year term. And the current one, he travels with the Queen. So wherever the Queen is, he's standing under her window with his bagpipes. And he found out that his wife was very, very ill. And uh, she was in London. She was diagnosed as terminal. And he had to go back to be with her. And, you know, I'm sure the Queen was not dandling his kids on her knee. But the firm or, you know, the office of the queen, whoever said, go, we'll watch your kids. He was up there with his children uh, who were school age at the time. And the kids stayed there and were taken care of so that he could go be with his wife. Wow. The family has certainly has a lot of things to do, but it was to me, it seemed like an incredibly generous act of kindness. Yeah. To say to an employee, essentially, go be with your wife and we'll make sure your children are okay while you're gone. And I don't know why, but that just really gave me a lift. I love that. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. All of your peaches are perfect. I love when guests go like sweeping with it because I think because Brian and I do this every week, sometimes twice a week. (laughs) Got to be a little bit specific about it. Yeah. But those were great. Yeah. I can imagine it's like me with Crosswords Live and it's like, okay, here we go. Another crossword. Yeah. Yeah. Me frantically in my notes app, like, oh God, what are good things that are happening right now? (laughs) Which is the point of doing it, of forcing you to acknowledge like, yeah, there are positive, beautiful things here. No, I love that. I think it's very important. Perfect. That means we're at the end of the episode. Deb, this was truly delightful. I'm so glad that we got to do this. I am too. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. And if people want to read your work or find you online, where can they do that? They can go to nytimes.com and find Wordplay, which is the crossword and puzzle and games section of the New York Times. I'm also the author of a book that's been out for a while, but it's called It's Not PMS, It's You, which is a humor book about relationships. And that's pretty much it. I'm all over the place. Wonderful. I'm all simply in my kitchen putting things in jars. (laughs) (laughs) that's where we're all aspiring to be really folks at home thank you once again for joining us for this episode take care of yourselves hope you're vibing thriving and surviving that you're feeling flirty fun and fresh i'm not going to tell you all the fuck off this week oh no do it do it do it come on that's my favorite one i feel like it's inappropriate to tell people to fuck off this week you've only said it twice already well i want to make it special when i tell people to fuck off (laughs) you know what that that's a really good argument that's a really good argument Can you tell someone specific to fuck off? Ooh, I like that. Like, good morning to everybody except for somebody? I do like that. I can't think of anyone I have hire for. There are plenty. 
but I like this. I'm banking that for next week. It's yours. I, I mean, I could say something <laughs> like, you know, good morning to everybody except the Verizon company. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, Verizon, fuck off. Listeners, fuck off. That's the end of the episode. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Late Night is produced by Brian Wett, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com.